you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the, world. in the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. The CEOs, authors, thought leaders, visionaries, and motivators. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times. Because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks. It's Voss here from thechrisvossshow.com. There you go, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the big show. We certainly appreciate you guys being here. As always, thanks for tuning into the Chris Voss Show. We couldn't do it without you. For 15 years, we've been bringing you the smartest people, the CEOs, the billionaires, the White House presidential advisors, the governors, the Congress members, U.S. ambassadors, astronauts, TV and Pulitzer Prize winners, the authors that spend a lifetime developing their trade, learning their stories, overcoming cathartic events, rising from the ashes like a phoenix, and bringing those stories in the distilled version of the Chris Voss Show to give our elite audience that wonderful Chris Voss Show glow, as we like to call it, the Chris Voss Show. As always, refer the show to your family, friends, and relatives. Go to goodreads.com, Fortress Chris Voss, linkedin.com, Fortress Chris Voss, Chris Voss One on the Tickety Talkity, and Chris Voss Facebook. Dot com. We have an amazing gentleman and author on the show with us today. And you may have heard of some of his prior business with his tax service, et cetera, et cetera. He is the author of the book that came out April 26, 2016. I Compete, How My Extraordinary Strategy for Winning Can Be Yours. John T. Hewitt joins us on the show today. And we're talking to him about his new company, what he's been doing and how he's doing it. John Hewitt is a renowned American entrepreneur who's made a significant impact in the business world through his innovative ideas and strategic thinking. He is best known for his success in the tax preparation industry, having founded two of the largest tax preparation companies in the United States. Jackson Hewitt and Liberty Tax. I'm mean, sure everyone's seen the guys out in the corner spinning those, doing those spinning things to, to do that, and probably the ads. Both companies represent two of the largest top 100 retail organizations in North America. He founded and grew two of them. In 2012, Liberty Tax Service operated 4,000 locations in the U.S. and Canada. International Franchise Association Entrepreneur in 2005. Accounting Today, top 100 most influential people selling a best-selling author in his book i compete which is kind of like iphone it's got a little small e i before the compete and how and uh, ink magazine was ranked number two in the tax industry and was one of the fastest growing private companies in the united states and he joins us here today welcome to the show john how are you incredible Thank you. incredible awesome it's wonderful to have you as well sir give us the dot com of the new company we're going to be talking about today that you're working on Working on loyalty brands, we have we have eight different franchisors under our umbrella. There you go. Loyaltybrands.com is the website. Do I have that correct? That's exactly right. There you go. And is there any other places on the internet you want people to get to know you better? I'm happy with everything under loyalty brands. There you go. So go there for all the good stuff. So give us a 30,000 overview, John, of what, what you're doing there at Loyalty Brands. Well... As you already mentioned, I found in so two large public companies that have 10,000 locations at Jackson Hewitt and Liberty Tax. Yeah. And then I said, what am I going to do next? And I said, let's, let's get a conglomerate of different franchisors that mm -hmm. can do cross-marketing. We can mentor and grow together. And so we have eight different brands that we are building si simultaneously. Now... Mm -hmm. It's sort of the 80-20 rule. Two of them are growing by leaps and bounds, and the others are slower. Mm -hmm. But our, our two premier brands are taxes, for sure. That's my, been my 54-year career at ATAX. But Zoom and Grooming, the mobile grooming, is is growing exponentially faster than even, even the tax division. Wow. Yeah, well, you know, the great thing about, I should, come to think of it, I should have went in the tax business years ago because there's always two constants in life, as the, as the ancient people say, death and taxes. So it was either that or the funeral business, I guess. 
There you go. <laughs> Benjamin Franklin said that 250 years ago. There you go. And, and boy, was he, that man had some vision. Zoom and grooming is probably a great business too, because, you know, I have dogs and probably with COVID and all the weird things that, that went on, you know, remote working, people working from home now, that, that's probably a great business for that as well. Yeah, that, I've, I've learned that that's another certainty of life. People, you know, you, there's nowhere else you can get unconditional love. And some uh, people love their, their pets better than their children, better than their spouse, better than anything. It's, yeah. and again, that love is, is just unbelievable. It's the best. I've, got, I've had four Huskies. And aside from the hair, the love is the best. <laughs> so there, there you go. There's good and bad in everything. Oh, yeah. And, and, and it's so hard to take your dog, you know, get him in the car, you know, then they want to, then they want to tear up the car and your car gets full of fur, at least mine for Huskies, having someone come and, you know, pick them up and do it. And then, you know, you gotta, you gotta go into the pet store that does the grooming and, you know, then they want to fight or bark at the other pets. And it's a whole, it's a whole drama thing to try and go to the pet store with for grooming. So yeah, having someone come and, and do a home-based mobile grooming seems to be a lot better. So what was your objective in, and these are franchise opportunities that you're offering to people who want to buy franchises, who want to buy pre-modeled businesses where they don't have to learn the business. They don't have to go through the, the, the rigmarole and, and, and potential loss of trying to figure out the proper way to do the business and the, and market it as opposed to, you know, failing at it, which a lot of business owners do when they start their own companies. Exactly. 95% of businesses that aren't franchises fail within five years. Yeah. And 95% of franchises succeed after five years. It's, it's 19 to one, more likely you're going to succeed if you're a franchisee rather than a, than a mom and pop. And, and that's because you, you nailed it. You have to have a system of doing business. That's yeah. critical to your, and, and it's our job and my job to give you the best system in the industry. It's your job to, to follow that recipe and, and build your business with our help. Mm -hmm. And so you guys offer several different companies. Let me see. There's Estrella Insurance, does property and casualty insurance, Ledgers, which does helping small business owners, loyalty business brokers that I guess buying and selling of companies and businesses. Little Medical School provides curriculum for children with focus on healthcare. The Inspection Boys, which does home inspections, staffing service, Jawsome staffing, staffing service. That would, seems like that would be pretty good for recruitment. American Exteriors, Experts, and Bubbly, all in one laundry and dry cleaning service. I need that, actually. I hate going to the dry cleaning thing. But does that, does that a, is that a thing where they do pickup? Or? Yeah, it's absolutely all mobile. Oh, I love that. I hate having doing the dry cleaning separately. I mean, I'll do my laundry, but the dry cleaning is always a pain in the butt. You got to go over to the thing and deliver it yep. and then, and all that stuff. So you offer these businesses and people can franchise them. They can reach out to your guys' website and find out different opportunities, how to get started. They can call you guys. What, what, what are some of the ways that they can onboard with you? Well, the easiest thing to do is, is to reach out to us and we take you through the steps. I mean, mm -hmm. when, when, we bring in a new franchise. It's not, we don't try to sell anyone anything. We try to find the right person. And so we, we take people through a, a number of steps. Number one, should you be self-employed? 70% mm -hmm. of Americans want to be self-employed, but only about 20 can be self-employed. 20%? So yeah, we have to help you decide if you should be self-employed, help you decide <laughs> what's the right industry. What's, mm -hmm. And then if you decide on an industry, what's the right vehicle? Mm -hmm. And then is this the right time in your life? Can you can you afford to step out of your business? Are are everyone healthy in your family? Are you gonna stay in the same city for the next five or ten years? There's a lot of things to consider to make sure that we find the right people. There you go. Let's extrapolate that a little bit more because I have that argument with some people about whether or not everybody can be an entrepreneur. And I've been an entrepreneur since 18, started over 30 companies. You've, you've been incredibly successful with what you've done, built the offices, and you've probably seen so many different people come and go and trying to start companies as, 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 as somewhat I have, probably yours in a larger scale. Do you, you, so you really believe that, that maybe 20% of people have that sort of capability, that mindset, that ability to be agile and, and, and do what entrepreneurs do? Yeah, those are statistics from the 
5,200 people I brought in to in as franchisees that and and it it comes down to a number of things risk taking Mm -hmm. you know the 10 most important two letter words are if it is to be it is up to me Mm -hmm. and some people need a boss some people aren't going to get up in the morning and and they're not self-starters so you have to be a self-starter you have to be a risk taker Mm -hmm. and you have to understand that that no one's put on earth to skate. You're going to face adversity. And there's going to be ups and downs. And those those things stop a lot of people. They just were never meant to be self-employed. Yeah. We, we had a mortgage. One of my big companies was a mortgage company for 20 years. And every now and then someone would come to me and they'd be like, hey, I'm a retired math teacher. I, I want to I quit my job and, and go start a company. And, you know, I'd sit with them and they, ha- they would have this rudimentary sort of thinking that you see math teachers is probably a good way to break it down. And I'd just be like, you, you really don't have the sort of agility of mindset to, to really become an entrepreneur. And they want to borrow money out of the equity of their home. And I, and I would tell them, I'd just be like, you, you just do not have the mindset for this. And I, I, I'm just warning you that if you're going to go spend thirty or 50000 doing a mortgage loan to tap in your home equity and you're going to blow it on this, you can do it. You know, I mean, we built, I, I wrote, as I wrote my book, Beacons of Leadership, we built my first company, multimillionaire company with $2,000 in sweat equity. And a year and a half later, we started a mortgage company with $4,000 in sweat equity. And those companies lasted almost 20 years until 2008. <laughs> but, you know, I've seen people, I remember having a guy in my mortgage company one time, you know, we started with $4,000. It was profitable. With, both companies were profitable in the first three months and just grew exponentially. And I remember one one time we at our at our pinnacle, we had I had a guy come in and he'd blown through $200,000 to start his mortgage company. And he'd, of course, bought all the Class A office buildings, you know, the nicest furniture. You know, meanwhile, when we started our company, we were just like, you know, we're going down to Goodwill and buying stuff. And and I, and he was just astounded that he couldn't he he blown through two hundred thousand dollars to build a company in in a year and he'd hit the wall and here we we built our company with four thousand dollars and and he was just astounded he's like I I can't figure out how I made it work I was astounded too I'm like how did you blow it <laughs> I'm gonna cite you anytime I get in these arguments with people because sometimes people will tell me they're like no anybody can be an entrepreneur they just have to learn. And I'm like, well, it's a lot of learning because I've been doing it since 18. So there you go. Let's get into your journey. I think people are probably interested in you at this point. Can you give us your hero's journey, your story, what shaped you, what got you in the tax business, what got you being an entrepreneur, gave you that bug? Yeah, I was blessed when I was in college. My dad had always wanted to be an entrepreneur. And I was born when in the summer of his freshman year at Michigan State. And he had three children before he graduated and five children a few years later. So he never had the the amount of income and net worth to become self-employed. By the Mm -hmm. time I was in college, he said, okay, now I can do it. And he called eights in our block and tried to buy a franchise. And in a suburb of Buffalo where we lived, I was going to the University of Buffalo. And they said, as a matter of fact, we're going to open a company store this year. But why don't you have your son take our tax course? Maybe he could work for us. Hmm. And I was blessed. I found out at 20 years old what I wanted to do the rest of my life. Wow. And I, 12 years later, was running 250 H&R Block locations. And my dad interceded again. He said, hmm. ready to be self-employed. Now he was the CFO of a public company. And he liked the little Apple computer that he bought by mail oh. better than the mainframe that was running his public company. So he decided we should build tax software for an Apple computer. So we both quit our jobs in 1981 and built Apple tax software, the first of its kind. Wow. No one wanted it way ahead of its time. Mm-hmm. Got blessed, and I found a company in Virginia Beach called Mel Jackson Tax Service. Mm-hmm. Mel had died. We bought six offices from his widow. The mm-hmm. biggest blessing was I moved to Virginia Beach, and the weather is so much nicer than Buffalo. <laughs> so I've been to, I've been in Virginia Beach since August of 1982. Wow! We changed the name to Jackson Hewitt. We merged the two companies. We only raised 129,000 
to start Jackson Hewitt. And, wow. And 15 years later, we sold it for $483 million. That is awesome. And here, that the other guy blew through 200000 It's good. Yeah, exactly. There you go. So, <laughs> so he's not at our level. Definitely. So, sold my company and then had a three-year non-compete, opened Liberty Tax in Canada because there were no Jackson Hewitts in Canada, no uh. non-compete. And having grown up in Buffalo, I knew the Canadian tax system. Mm -hmm. So uh, came back to the United States in 2000. Now I had to compete against my own name and my own software and my own system. <laughs> And yet we kicked their butt. We grew faster than Jackson Hewitt and Block combined. We opened 4,000 offices in 12 years. Wow. And became the top 10 fastest growing franchisor ever. My second of the top 100 retail franchise chains in the country. And again, a $500 million public company. Again, I sold my stock. And now we have loyalty brands. There you go. So what do, what do you, I mean, you grew at an exponential rate and obviously have a track record of being successful. What do you cite as your, as the reason for that? Is it you? Is it your leadership style? Uh, it, yeah, I mean, well, what, 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 do, you, what yeah. do you think of that if, in your head? Yeah, absolutely. I'm blessed. I've seen, mm -hmm. I've seen hundreds of, of people try to go national against H&R mm -hmm. Block. Mm -hmm. And only one person's done it, and now I've done it twice. <laughs> so so the, when people say, what is the number one attribute that you have that that enabled you to do that? And really, it's, it's I always, number one, is I try to do what's best for every person. Mm -hmm. And when it's best for both of us, that's even nicer. But if if being with us isn't the best for them, God bless you. Go find somewhere else to be extraordinary. So the number one attribute that I that I've grown up with is trying to do what's right for best for every person I meet. Oh, there you go. You know, as you as you've done this, I mean, this has to be done with leadership. Of course, leadership is one of my favorite topics to talk about on the show, as our audience knows. What aspects of of your leadership and your mindset do you feel are the real strengths? that, you know, you've developed over the years that, that give you the ability to, you know, move in the ways that you move and build what you built, you know, and like you say, in beating HR block twice. I think that, that in America, that many, if not most leaders still think of, of their employees as servants or lesser individuals. And so they order them around without listening to them. And so, I learned long ago that I, as, as long as I have happy, successful franchisees and happy, successful employees, then I can't, I can't, I'm going to grow exponentially. So it comes down to happy, successful franchisees, happy, successful employees. So when I, someone works for me, most people think, well, they got to make me happy. Well, I got to make them happy as, as much as they make me happy. Mm -hmm. So that's why at, we call our our company loyalty because I have three people with me 35 years, three mm -hmm. people with me 30 years, five people with, with me 25 years. I have just an immense following because the only way you get loyalty is to give loyalty. Mm. So you need to treat people right. There you go. There's a there's a kind of a new thing that everyone talks about. I'm, I'm not sure how new it is, but it seems to be catching fire at least in discussions we have with authors on the show of servant leadership of of you know kind of it seemed like in the old world we kind of had this world where you know especially like the old ibm sort of status world where you know it was it was kind of like authoritarian sort of leadership where you know do, do what i say or get fired and now there seems to be this discussion of, of what people call servant leadership especially in this era of competitive employment environments you know people working from home People, employees having, you know, their, this discretion where they can be like, I think I'd just rather go work for somebody else and really, you know, quitting jobs because leadership sucks. What What's your take on this, this concept of servant leadership? I, I abide by it 100%. And mm -hmm. the way that I feel, I define servant leadership is for each of the re people that report to me, every year we set up goals and budgets. And, mm -hmm. and once we have that budget and goals decided, then I stand back and I'm here to help you. You and you know your targets, right? Mm -hmm. If you know, for example, if 
if your target is to do X number of tax returns each month or open X number of offices, you know black and white whether you're failing or succeeding. Mm. So your your goal is to hit those numbers, and I'm here to assist you. I'm not here to to direct you. If both of us think alike, one of us is useless. So I, I, <laughs> I like I need that paradigm. To, I, I need to, you to allow you to make mistakes, and mm-hmm. but you have to keep me informed. If mm-hmm. if you have a goal at the end of a month or three months that you know you're going to miss, then you can't wait until that you miss. You have to tell me in advance that I'm not going to be able to meet this goal. So I either need advice or more resources. I need to change my budget or get some advice because I'm not going to meet those goals. Mm -hmm. And that's servant leadership. Mm -hmm. And I totally agree 100% that that's the way to manage in, in the 21st century. There you go. And you've got the pedigree to show for it. I mean, when you've got a loyalty group, executive group around you, like you say, for a multitude of decades and years, I mean, that means people stay with you and and you've, you've got your finger on the pulse. You talk about in your book, and you alluded to it there, where you must not monitor or you must monitor results, not activities. And so it sounds like you you set the goal, you set the vision out there and then and help people to achieve it. Yeah, the uh, some even some of the executives I've hired, I I had a CFO one time that would watch out the window to see which of his employees were in the office by nine o'clock. I mean, really? that's, that's ridiculous, right? I I just you know where you stand with me because you have targets that are deadlines with numerical targets, and if you're on target, then you don't need to wonder where you stand. But if you're missing then you know where you stand. It's either it's pass fail. You're yeah. either meeting your target or not. And you know where you stand with me. You don't have to wonder. I don't really care what time you come to work. I don't mm-hmm. care how much vacation you take. You, We agree on the resources you get, mostly money and people and so forth. And then we agree on your goals. And mm-hmm. then it's up to you to achieve that. There you go. And I like that sort of methodology. You know, a lot of leaders don't really think about the culture they build, the how they come off and how they represent themselves, how their people perceive them. You know, sometimes they're not self-accountable. I've seen cultures that are blame cultures where everyone's trying to avoid liability and being blamed for something and getting fired. I've seen cultures where it's very high school popularity contest where little to no work gets done, but everyone just kisses ass to the boss and the boss just adulates and the attention and stuff. And I've seen the micromanagement that you referred to as well, but I like your aspect of giving people the goals to go to because it's a real it's a real vision sort of thing. You know, the, the great people who built companies in this world, the Steve Jobs, et cetera, et cetera, they, they've, built, they've given people a vision to go for and chase. How important do you think vision is into what you do? Do you think about it consciously and, and set goals? I mean, obviously you've set goals, so I'm setting up for this. Yeah, I think one of the key two or three most important things about exponential growth, mm-hmm. and I'm talking about growing from, zero to 4,000 in 12 years, right? Mm-hmm. That, that's a lot of offices that's kind of, cr- and competing against my own name and my own software. Yeah. And that's a big, hairy, audacious goal. Mm-hmm. But you have to set high goals. Mm-hmm. Uh, when I mean, if you think about how it's almost stupid or crazy, when I set out in 2000 to compete against my own company, Jackson Hewitt and H&R Block with 9,000 offices and said, we're going to be number one. We're going to grow faster than, than Block or Jackson Hewitt. And that's crazy with zero offices and competing against 12,000 of their offices. And to, to, to believe that you can do that is just is either crazy or stupid, right? Mm-hmm. But we proved it. We, we opened 4,000 offices in 12 years, more wow. than both of them combined. And top 10 fastest growing franchise or ever. So you have to set goals and have vision. So to be a, to accomplish great things, you have to have a vision that's that's audacious, mm-hmm. yet yet some realism to it. That you're proven that you can accomplish those numbers. It can't be totally insane, but it has to it has to be challenging for sure. Mm-hmm. What are some other top strengths that you have in your CEO toolbox that you utilize? Would you say? 
so if we well the the key is always wanting what's best for other people mm-hmm. and the i'll give you some of my weaknesses one is i'm not a great communicator mm-hmm. uh, i'm that's peter drucker said in the book the effective executive he said people with great strengths have great weaknesses mm-hmm. so if you want to if I agree with that wholeheartedly. So if I believe I have great strengths, then I have great, great weaknesses. Mm-hmm. Um, but I am good at identifying people and giving them the opportunity. I've created a thousand millionaires and people oh. often thank me for, they thank me for what I've done. What I, what I tell them, I get for a, na- I gave you a chance for a nanosecond. After that, it's up to you to run mm-hmm. with it, right? Again, if it is to be, it is up to me. I create the system, mm-hmm. but you do the work and you, you're the one that I give all the training to and the guidance to and the mentorship to. And I, I think part of that then is I'm a, I'm a good listener. Mm-hmm. When, when I have a conversation with my employees or my franchisees or potential franchisees, they will always do 99% of the time do most of the talking. I, mm-hmm. I do things, I accomplish things by asking questions and listening and then then making a, a informed decision after i have all the information there you go it you know and the thing you mentioned that you know your fallacies you know that your 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 things you're not strong on but you have that that then it that invokes that you have self accountability and self actualization where you know your strengths, you know your weaknesses, you're very aware of them. Most people, I don't think, are aware, and especially leaders, maybe aren't aware of their weaknesses. We had somebody on yesterday who does a, a huge business they've been doing for 20 years, This these business surveys where they go into a company with leaders and they do these giant surveys from the employees as to how they evaluate their leadership. And sometimes it's, it's a, <laughs> I was joking. It was a crossfire, a circular firing squad. Sometimes they'll do the whole company, you know, a thousand people where they're evaluating everybody in the company and, and, and then they sit down with the surveys afterwards and try and figure out their strengths and how they're perceived and all that sort of good stuff. And I think being self-actualized as a entrepreneur is really important. Like, for me, in my business, I, I could be the visionary. I could be the guy who could generate ideas and, and come up with stuff and was constantly the tinker and the innovator. But I had to have a business partner as my vice president that for 13, 14 years that was not only my best friend of 22 years, but that I could trust beyond a shadow of a doubt. But also, he could do the rudimentary work. So I could make a business model or a widget or some sort of function. I could be like, okay, here's the application of the business operations for R and D or you know telemarketing or whatever you know sort of business function it was, and I could innovate that, and then I could give it to him, and he could make sure that 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 plate kept spinning. Where for me, that aspect of the business was just mentally draining. Like I would just. That, that just make me mental do the same thing over and over again. But he, for him, it was great. If I handed him a yellow pad and said, hey, I need you to come up with some visionary ideas to fix maybe what's bleeding out in our company or I need, a, I need some help on this because, you know, I don't have all the great ideas. Can you come up with anything? And he, he literally couldn't come up with anything. And so we had that great partnership and me knowing what were my strengths and he knowing what were his strengths made for the great combo. And I think a lot of leaders need to know you know, not, not only like you say, and a spouse, what their strengths are and what their, and know what their weaknesses are so they can find people who can fill that gap. Yeah, I was interviewed just the other day and someone said, well, when you're starting a company from scratch and, and you're the CEO, who's your first hire? And I said, it depends on your skill set. Uh-huh. You hire people with, with skills that you don't have. Mm-hmm. And I'm poor at communication. I'm poor at delegation. I'm sorry, not, I'm great at delegation. I'm sorry. I'm poor at detail. Ah. And, and I want to go too fast. You know, a, a, good, a great CEO needs a great CFO to hold them back. There you go. So if it were up to me, I would run too fast and the rest couldn't keep up. So I, I need help in detail. I need help in structure and, and slowing down occasionally and communicating. So, so you hire people that have different skill sets. Mm-hmm. 
and then compliment yours. And so exactly. fill in those gaps and then build a complete team around you. I think do you, I'm not going to, well, I'm not going to shade it with my thing, but do you think that you think that people, one of the problems that CEOs have is they think they have to be all of the things that they need. They have to do all the things and do, you know, they have problems delegating. They, they, they think that they have to be the, the, the person who does everything. And a lot of times they have to start out that way for financial reasons. You know, you, when you're you know, starting on your home, you, you kind of have to do everything, but there's a point of scale where you need to delegate and not do everything. And, and I think a lot of people get stuck with that in their head. They become micromanagers usually at that point. Yeah. I think there's two problems in that. And, and one problem is some people think they can do everything, mm-hmm. and, which is a huge, huge fallacy. And then, and then, most people can't delegate. It's to me, it's the number one disease in American management. Really, inability to delegate. Ah, there you go. And then do what you do, where you set goals and you let them run and give them servant leadership, as opposed to that's that's you know. difficult to let people make mistakes. Yeah, you know, I did an interview at Jackson Hewitt with my marketing director, chief marketing officer. In 1990, she had been with me two years. Now she's been with me 35 years. Wow! And and I did a we did a end of the year review, and she and I said I always finish off the review is saying, was there any way I could help you do your job better? And she said, yeah. Sometimes I make mistakes, and and you know better, and you could ha- save me from making the mistake. I said, but then you wouldn't learn, and uh-huh. then, and then I would have to do everything. I need mm-hmm. I need a skilled chief marketing officer who and the the human beings tend to own, learn best by making mistakes. So I need to allow you the flexibility of not telling you exactly what to do. Otherwise, you're useless. If I have to tell you everything, mm-hmm. then why do I need you? I need someone to think freely when you think separately and I'm not always right. When when each of two of us are stronger than than each of us separately. There you go. And you write about that in your book, Why Mistakes Are a Wise Person's Education. What, why is making mistakes important in, in doing education as an entrepreneur? Well, they say, you know, the mm-hmm. saying is smart people learn from their mistakes. Ah. And I got to tell you, there's not a lot of smart people. <laughs> so so I've people got one are learning. And then, and then the corollary is wise people learn from the mistakes of, ep- of others. And ah. so that takes a special ability because most people don't even learn from their own mistakes. They keep, <laughs> they keep repeating their mistakes. That, that's essential. And, and that's what you need to understand when you're part of a franchise system. Mm-hmm. It's, again, it's our job to give you the best system in the industry. It's your job to follow that system and not not invent and recreate the wheel. Mm -hmm. You know, I I talk about this a lot on the show. Being, you know, we we joke about how people constantly come up to me and, hey, Chris, I'm going to be like you. I'm going to start a company. Okay, great. Go ahead. Let's do it. And they're like, oh, well, I got to wait. You know, I got to wait till it's perfect. Everything's perfect. And I'm, you know, I'm ready and everything's ready to go. And you're like, it's never going to be perfect. You have to get started. It, it's you're you're constantly problem solving and making mistakes or finding mistakes and in problem solving for you know how to get that widget to work in the most profitable sense and then to scale it. And you just have to get started. It's it's basically I think I think they should just call it entrepreneurs problem solvers. That's pretty much all you do all day long. I was watching a TikTok recently of a guy who's who sells planes, you know, executive private planes, and he's been doing it for forty years. And he was doing a day in the life and I was just watching this two days ago and, and he talked about how, you know, I've been doing this for 40 years selling planes to people and, and people all over the world. And he goes, you know, what's funny is every day I still have new stuff that I have to problem solve on things I have to fix new issues that come up, new, new regulations or problems. He goes, you would think after 40 years that, you know, it would just be like, you know, a cakewalk. You'd be just like, it's the same thing over and over again. He goes, no, after 40 years, it's still new problems. I still have to problem solve every day. And that's really what people have to do. And 
you know, you, you bring up a good point of people making mistakes and you have to be okay with those mistakes. You have to be able to take the paradigm of going, okay, well, we, we failed at this. We sucked at this. How do we turn this around? How do we, how do we make this a building block? There's a old famous story. It might be Watson from IBM, the old CEO. I think it came from C Hewlett Packard or, or Watson, Tom Watson, came Tom from, Watson, yeah, probably him. Yeah, it, it either came from Tom Watson and IBM or it was Hewlett Packard. I can't remember where it came from. But it's a story of how one of their vice presidents lost, like, I think the figure was like $11 million or $12 million on a deal. And the executive comes into his office, the CEO, and says, Hey, I'm here to tender my resignation. I just lost the company, you know, millions of dollars. And he says, What do you mean? We're not, we're not letting you quit. We're not firing you. We just spent $11 million educating you on what not to do we're not letting you go we just made an investment in you and so that mindset i think is is so important to, to realize that yeah you've, you've got to let your employees make mistakes you've got to let them learn and probably make sure that they learn from it because you know what the employees are doing the same thing over and over again i fired a number of those where i'm just like this is the eighth time we've said that we shouldn't do this <laughs> you keep doing it but uh, yeah problem solving and all that good stuff Exactly. And, and, and earlier in that, you said that in rolling out new systems and, and I, it frustrates me beyond belief that we continually roll out and improve and develop a new system. But, but people try to get it exactly right before they roll it out. Yeah. And a hundred percent, I think a hundred percent of the systems I've, I've rolled out, whether we spent four hours preparing or four days preparing it needed to be adjusted. So I'm like, you know, let's, you know, let's get it started and yeah. learn, learn from the customers, learn from the employees, learn on the fly. You're not going to think of every, of everything in advance. Mm -hmm. So roll it out and then test it and then improve it and be ready to fix it and improve it. There you go. I mean, I remember the early days of our business, there were some times where I was standing in front of clients selling them on our services, and then I'd leave the thing getting a contract and a deal, and I'm like, I got to get a whole lot more of these deals put together, or I don't know how we're going to deliver on what we're going <laughs> to we just promised. But I, I knew we could do it from a from a from a sweat equity point of view, but I'm like, I have to get more customers to make this really work and be profitable. And so you just had to build it, sell it and go. And, uh, and people bought me, but you're right. It's constant problem solving. I mean, maybe that's what they should name entrepreneurs. It shouldn't be called entrepreneurs. It should just be called eternal problem solvers. You know, every day you're, you're having to deal with stuff. But well, John, as we go out, final thoughts and pitch out on uh, people that can onboard with you, reach out to you that are interested in the franchise opportunities there at Loyalty Brands. Sure, I'm easy to reach. I'm on Wikipedia. I'm on loyaltybrands.com. My email is john at loyaltybrands.com. Easy to find me. There you go. Loyaltybrands.com. You can check out some of the services they have going on over there. John, it's been wonderful to have you on and brilliant discussion on entrepreneurism. <laughs> You've made over 1,000 millionaires. I have that correct? That's exactly right. <laughs> there you go. That should just be your tag. I'm John Hewitt, and I made 1,000 millionaires. <laughs> there you go thank you for coming on the show and inspiring everybody and hopefully we'll make some more with your guys service and what you do thanks thank for coming you, on the show thank you thank thanks for audience for tuning in go to goodreads.com for chess chris foss order up his book i compete that's a small i with the word compete attached to it like iphone i compete how my extraordinary strategy for winning can be yours by john t hewitt go to youtube.com for chess chris foss linkedin.com for chess chris foss subscribe to the linkedin newsletter and the 130,000 linkedin group over there chris foss facebook.com thanks for tuning in be good to each other stay safe and we'll see you guys next time